I'm continuously surprised that Nuclear Throne doesn't crash more. Yeah, I, I still want to get better at the Switch version to see when it breaks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually did a lot of testing, which is like forwarding the game into loops, and yeah. it stays stable most of the time, which... Yeah, I mean, my friend is, I think his record is something like loop 12, or right. something like that. He's got like 1,700 hours in the game, which is ridiculous. Right. I can't compete with that. I got like 500 or something. Right. But um, he, he wanted to ask, I was like, do you have any, you're a nuclear throne nut more than I am, do you have any questions? And he just asked, um, when you made the game, how far did you think people would, would be able to take it? Like how, did you think there was a limit? So so actually, when you have the mutated IDPD, right, loop three, I think, um, we created those, and I think in the code, they're actually like a curse word. <laughs> because we they were meant genuinely to just end created... It. Yeah, they were, meant yeah. To, they were meant to end the run. So we thought, you know, people will get loop one. Loop two seems like it's doable, but it'll be hard. Loop three is kind of what we expected as like, Nobody's gonna make it past yeah. that. And then to make sure we made those we made the mutated IDPD. We had sort of like a good narrative, like thing to hook into. So we thought, okay, we'll um we'll end things there. And then nobody will get past that. <laughs> and then later on it turns out that those are pretty much like required to loop further for a lot of builds. Yeah. Where a lot of builds are like radiation dependent. Yeah, I mean so, I can tell you my, my friend always tells me that loop two is the hard part. Right, and then, and then after that, if you just got like a super plasma cannon and an ultra shovel, you can just yep. keep it going. So yeah, that's not what we expected. <laughs> yeah. uh, we genuinely thought loop three would sort of be the the end game. Oh, it's great though. I was I was thinking about this how long it's actually been since the game was fully released because I was playing it sort of mid early access. I used to watch like sleep cycles, let's play videos right. every morning before breakfast. Tom. Yeah, it was a great time. Oh. I, I missed. Yeah, I miss. I miss all of them. Yeah, Tom and uh, Kakajo and like sort of like the yeah. old community. And it was such uh, a. I've got to say, it was. It was almost like the release of the game was kind of the end of it. Almost. It, it was, was sad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was really sad because for us, we also we were very aware of the fact that when Nuclear Throne will be done, the updates would stop and the yeah. uh, and we would, you know, you whenever you release something, you always sort of accept that you're going to drift away from it. That's yeah. that's part of the creative process, like. You make a thing, you move on. Uh, Flamber doesn't really, uh, you know, we never did sequels. So for us, it, we knew that this was the last of Nuclear Throne that we would do. And maybe there'd be a port or maybe there'd be like some other stuff, but um, we will be drifting away from the community. And uh, it, it was genuinely a very bittersweet moment to wrap up. What was it at that point? Three, four years of work? God, oh, yeah, it was like... Um, 2013 to 15 or something but like late. right yeah so yeah 100 100 updates <laughs> yeah. uh and and it was done and we were not gonna have the same nonsense and the same like uh communications and the weekly sort of s scheme yeah. but at the same time for me you know uh, i remember the first saturday after we were done and just sitting there on my saturday just being like what do i do with a saturday <laughs> yeah what are these for? Because they had always <laughs> been like, okay, get the build up, check that everything's okay, make sure you didn't upload the right, wrong thing, write the update text. Usually I do that on Friday. Um, write the update text, make sure everything's okay. And then, you know, it's the first Saturday after, and you're just sitting here just being like, now what? <laughs> what do I do? And there was no like panic on Sunday to like <laughs> make sure everything would be okay. It was just like done. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, how did you, what was it that made you decide, like, we're going to have to end it now? Because I honestly, like, I was thinking about this, like, the game is almost its own subgenre of, like, potential. Like, you could keep adding stuff to this game yep. forever. You could have just, like, the, like, cool mechanics, but completely different set of characters and weapons and areas. Yeah, for sure. Into perpetuity. <laughs> Yeah, so that was one of the things we really quickly realized about Nuclear Throne <laughs> is that we had infinite space to add and that most things would make the game better, right? Yeah. It still needed to be with a little bit of, like, restraint and you can look at some of the mods that let go of restraint <laughs> and they're really fun for, like, 20 minutes. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, yeah, I, 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 I get it. Um, it's the mods that show restraint that really work, that, that sort of, like, play with like the balance that play with with like the the opportunity and the powers of the characters and sort of like the way they they work or don't work with each other but i think uh, you know at the start that was really great because we were doing an early access game so we had infinite we had infinite time to early access this game but um so from a business perspective it was great from a creative perspective <laughs> it was great 
from a human perspective, that's kind of hard because, you know, you you never get a finish line. There's no light at the end yeah. of the tunnel. There's just more, right? And every time we'd add something, it would be either received well or eventually be received well, right? <laughs> so, yeah, like the vans. We, I think I remember. Right. I mean, every every basically everything you add ha is hated at first, yeah. right? That and that's something you learn when you do an early access game is. You don't listen to what people say the first three weeks. <laughs> you wait three weeks, and then after three weeks, if people are still complaining about it, okay, maybe something's wrong here. But I remember when we had Chicken go from uh, slow motion yeah, to throwing. Yeah, I, I forget about that. Like, we got wrecked on the forums. Like, people <laughs> hated it, absolutely hated it. Um, and I think originally people didn't like looping either. Really? Uh, yeah, but, um, you know, it's the kind of thing where you just kind of leave it and you check back like three to four weeks <laughs> later when people have had other stuff to be upset about. <laughs> and if that is still, if the original thing is still the thing they're upset about, more than they're upset about anything new, then it's time to look at stuff, yeah. right? But f for us, I think the moment we realized we were done was, was the human part of it. We were tired. We were incredibly yeah. tired near the end of Nuclear Throne. And it wasn't because we weren't excited about the game anymore. It's just that the pace was grueling. Like every week an update, every week like bug fixes, every week communicating with everybody, every week, you know, I, I hadn't had a weekend yeah. in four years. Like just wasn't part of my life anymore. Like yeah. you wake up on Monday, you look at what you want to achieve for the week. On Tuesday, you can only do the public stuff because we're live streaming. On Wednesday, you can do the quiet stuff. <laughs> On Thursday, you're live streaming again, which means you have to produce a full live stream and you have to, you know, like that, that's your day effectively. On Friday, you got to wrap things up. On Saturdays, you launch it. On Sunday, you do immediate bug fixes. And then it's Monday again. And you yeah, just do that forever for years <laughs> on end. So it was when our team realized that we're tired. We're incredibly tired and we, we need to be done with this. And we can keep working on it forever and we can probably keep making it better forever. But, you know, Paul was tired, JW was tired, Justin was tired, uh, jo um, Jonas, Yukio, I was tired, everybody was tired. and um, We just kind of went, okay, we're going to give ourselves X weeks. I think it was five weeks or four weeks before we shut it down. We, we made the decision to shut it down. And then we worked towards one big final update. And then uh, that was, I think, update 99? I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's where we kind of handed it back to the community and said, like, this is the game. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the ride, right? Yeah, I mean, I've got to say, it, it it's absolutely a finished game that even, like, as it is, is I keep, I play it, like, almost every day still. I don't right. do, I don't do well. I still haven't made it to Loop 3 without the help of my insane friend. But, um, right. but and I actually end up, I, I tend to play the Switch version more now. Just it's a very, it's honestly a very nice version of the game. I'm very yeah. happy with how the port came out. I was a bit worried about it, but uh, yeah, it came out well. There is one problem with it, which okay, I what which, is it? which is I don't know if you know about it, but the the uh, loop uh, thrown two just kind of like stops shooting after a first couple of shots. So you basically, if you don't have like usually I'm fine because I play as like horror or something, so I've got loads of rounds right. and ammo. But if you don't have a lot of ammo, you can just run out of ammo, and he just kind of right. wanders okay. around, <laughs> which is not ideal. No, that's not but, ideal. Um, we should give that a look. But there was a really funny, like I, I played co-op on the same screen with like my half brother, who's sort of kind of good at right. the game. But I carried him two throne two, and then we had that problem. But then we right. realized we both have each other's ammo types still. <laughs> so we wow. like so one of us died, and, like picked up the other ammo we made, right. it, which was that's smart. So it that's made fun. that experience. <laughs> so yep. it's, yeah, that's super good. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I think that was a large part of why Nuclear Storm was so fun to develop and why it took so long for us to get tired of it. It's just we were discovering new stuff all the yeah. time. We would be watching like Sleep Cycles, we'd be watching Coffee Joe, we'd be watching all of them. Uh, we'd be listening to the forums and like seeing what people are talking about. You know, like steroid sledgehammer grenade thing. <laughs> That's completely logical, but it wasn't something we had predicted until we saw somebody do it and we're like, oh yeah, no, no. Cool. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, it was just, it's such a good story machine, the game. Like every time you play, there's like a story of how your run went. And that was really what we aimed for. And I'm, I'm really proud of how well that worked in the end. Yeah, it's so good. I feel like, I feel like people don't talk enough about it. Like, this game should be just 
constantly in the conversation. I just love it. So right. Much. I think uh, I think I love, and this is a Vlambeer weakness, maybe, but we always did things that were a little ahead of their time, and yeah. sort of like we end up defining a mm. lot of things, right? Like we had Binding of Isaac as sort of like before us, but we were mostly inspired by things like Spelunky and Action Fist and uh, sort of like the older mix of like roguelikes and something else. Yeah. Right? <laughs> roguelike and platformer. Uh, Action Fist was roguelike and shooter. But like we kind of felt like there was an opportunity to do this. And it's not the first time we tried this game, right? We we tried this game in 2013 and we failed. We tried the game again, I think, in 2015. Uh, no, we, uh, 2012. We tried in 2012 and we failed. We tried again in 2013 and we failed. And it, it was the third time we tried it that it worked. <laughs> um, and it was honestly JW who had the, the brilliant idea. Because the problem we kept running into is that we were trying to make a top-down roguelike, uh, like Nuclear Thronus. <laughs> uh, but the thing we realized is every time we would make it, uh, people would run past the enemies to the exit of the level. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't until the third time we made it that JW just said, like, okay, what if, what if there is no exit? <laughs> what if the exit only appears when you kill the last enemy? And, and that fixed it. Like yeah. instantly the game worked. And it's, it's, that's kind of what I love about game development is very often people think about like game ideas, like these big things, complicated things to do a lot of world building. In reality, it's like small stuff like, what if there is no door? <laughs> That's honestly how Nuclear Throne became Nuclear Throne is, what if there is no door? How quickly did you realize, oh god, this is... <laughs> Big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I think originally it was made for a game jam, which kept it pretty small. It was called Wasteland Kings back in the yeah, day. Yeah. And uh, Jan Willem is, is uh, just an extraordinary prototyper. I, like, I cannot stress just how good... Uh, JW is at, at quickly making things work and feel nice. And they're not made well, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. That's not the yeah. point, right? We're trying to figure out whether it works. And uh, JW has such a, a well-developed sensibility for where you put effort, where you don't put effort. So the first version of, of Wasting Kings was already pretty fun. And if you can lock those cores, those cores down, how does movement work? How does, you know, how does it, how fast do you stop when you let go of walking? Yeah. Right. Do you slide like a little bit or do you stop immediate? Is it binary? Is it analog? Like what, what is happening? Right. Um, how does aiming feel? How does the camera move with your crosshair and your character? Right. Like when you figure all that out, you really quickly have a complete game. Wasteland Kings, when it was just three levels, was already fun. It was yeah. already good. And it, I think it was then when we realized, a little later when we realized that you can just keep adding to this forever. <laughs> and yeah, there were some scope concerns, but we also kind of realized that if you can add to it forever, you can also stop. Yeah. And whenever you want. Be, like it's right. ready from the start. Right. So we, we always kept that rule. The game always had to be shippable. Uh, we broke that rule a little later on, but um, <laughs> mostly because we wanted to add big things like the loops and the, the you know, Throne 2 and like the, the secret bosses in loop, in, uh, loop 1. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, think when I started playing if loops were in it. Yeah, I know, I remember when you added, there were loops before generators came later, didn't they? I think I was... Yeah, the way you did loops came later. Yeah. yeah. So originally the way it works is no matter what you did, you would always loop. Right, yeah, yeah, I remember that. There now. was no ending. Yeah. So we added the ending. We actually made looping optional instead of default. Yeah. Uh, that got a lot of anger. So my, <laughs> e my email was not fun that week. Um, it's a good decision, though. I mean, that's it, right? Like, and that's, you know, as a game developer, you have to sort of learn that you're not making what people want. You're making what is right for the game. And if people love the game, they'll presumably eventually come around to it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you got it wrong, they'll keep telling you. Yeah. I mean, I wish they would you know, say it a little politer at times, <laughs> yeah. but uh, the Nuclear Throne community in general, like I'm very proud to say, was incredibly constructive yeah. and incredibly kind. Like they knew that we were working hard. They knew that we cared about the game. They knew that we generally didn't let them down. Yeah, every now and then we make decisions that people looked at and were like, oh, obviously that's not going to work. And then sometimes they were right. But, you know, we're coming at it from a very different perspective. We're coming at it from like, what is production versus opportunity? Like how much work is something? Uh, do we think it fits? And uh, the best lesson I ever learned about something like that is like balance is only good when everybody uh, complains equally. 
<laughs> right? If there's a character that nobody complains about, that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want that because either nobody's playing it, which is bad, or everybody that's playing it has nothing to complain about, which is bad because we want a reason for you to try the other characters as well, right? So it's stuff like that that was just a lot of ongoing uh, learnings. And, and we made big mistakes uh, in the middle, some really fun ones. What would you say would, I don't know, list some of those? <laughs> oh, I think my favorite one was uh, somewhere probably a year, a year and a half into development, right? We kept getting the feedback that the early levels were boring. They were too easy. Right. <laughs> and we were like, okay, you know what? We'll make it a little harder, right? So we made it a little harder and we kept getting the feedback like, no, it's too easy. <laughs> so we made it a little harder again. And uh, eventually, two or three months later, we realized that the forums, we hadn't seen any new people join the forums. <laughs> we were like, how is that possible? Like, the numbers look good, right? People are buying the game. Uh, average hours are looking great. But like, what is happening that we're not seeing new people? And what turned out is that most people were bouncing off of the game. Yeah. Almost immediately, because we had made the intro so hard that all of the people that were in the community, <laughs> which are mostly experts, people yeah. that play the game a lot, people that have spent time in the forums, they enjoyed that. Uh, but everybody else just played the game once and then went like, eh, that's too hard. <laughs> uh, and then quit forever. So we ended up having to reset our community, which was a really interesting sort of uh, thought experiment. We, uh, we made the entry levels easier again. Yeah. And then we gave away like 75,000 copies of the game. Everybody who owned the game got a copy to give to a friend. I think that's how I got the game. That might right. have been when I started playing. Oh, so that's, that. that's when we went, yeah. oh, crap. <laughs> Everybody who plays this game is really good, and we're not getting feedback from new players. So can we trick the people that <laughs> are already playing into giving the game to people that they think will like the game but don't have experience yet. And then yeah. that way, the forums would pr hopefully light up again with new players. And uh, it, w it worked perfectly. Mm. So uh, that was a really big gamble because giving 75,000 copies of yeah. a game away, you know, that game is $12. That's like a year and a bit of development time that we just gave away. But um, after that, actually, the amount of conversation online increased rapidly. Lots more people ended up buying the game. I think it was probably one of the most successful decisions I've, I've made in my career yeah, I mean, was let's give away 75,000 copies <laughs> of a $12 game. It's like, when, uh, it's like when Nintendo in the Wii U era were like, you can get a free other game if you buy Mario Kart 8. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it, it's really wild. Like everything in you, in you sh is shouting like, you can't give away seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars of video game and expect to to survive as a game studio, but we really needed that new feedback. And yeah, you know, I would much rather not have much money to develop the game anymore, but have my last months on the project, you know, with good feedback, than work on the game for another year but have bad feedback for for the entire year. So. You know, it took some work to convince Valve. It took some work to convince yeah. uh, to convince the team to do it. But ultimately, I think I got everybody on board and and we executed on it. And it, it was really fun. It was really uh, yeah. I mean, thank yeah. you because I'm realizing now it got me into the game. <laughs> yeah, welcome. I'm glad that was that was one of the outcomes. Yeah, and I'm glad um, I'm glad I've now bought it on Switch to uh, to right. support the game as well. <laughs> I appreciate that too. Like, obviously, we're not yeah. developing on it anymore. But you know, it's it's the kind of thing where I grew up Egyptian. Uh, Dutch Egyptian, but every game I owned used to be pirated, mm. right? It's just I I didn't have money to make games. My parents didn't. Um, I didn't have money to play games. My parents didn't have money to make games. I uh, play a game, so uh, everything I owned was pirated. And I've been doing the same thing. Whenever I see a remake of a game that I loved back in the days, so I just I just buy it. Like I don't know if it still benefits the people who made it, but I couldn't have benefited them either way because yeah. I didn't have the money. Yeah. Like it. So uh, at least I like to think I was part of the, the conversation about the game and part of the hype around the game. And yeah, I, try to, I try to approach that the same thing now, right? If, if somebody got the game for free or somebody pirated the game because they couldn't afford it, I don't care. Like, enjoy the game, talk about it, tell your friends. Like, yeah, I guess it's kind of like people say that Spotify is essentially like pirate, pirating music. So I tend to buy right. like stuff on CD if I really like it, you know. It's... Right. And I think that's the right way, right? Like you, yeah. you listen to Spotify where you, you, you know, they get like... 0 0.0014 cents per listen <laughs> yeah. or something, which is not enough to sustain. But if you come across good music and you buy it, then you give people the opportunity to keep doing this. And I think same thing is true for games. If you need to like try games on Game Pass or you want to 
uh, Apple Arcade or you pirate them, like as long as you're not buying them on those resale websites, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> like that, I'm I'm fine with it. But I'd much rather you pirate them, right? Like to me, that that is that is sensible, and to me, that is fair. Pirate the game if you enjoy it. Please buy it if you can. And Absolutely. if you can't, then fine. Like they're like. Come on, the world is hard enough without like having like weird value judgments about whether you can pay twelve dollars for a game. <laughs> yeah. It's weirdly nostalgic talking about this video game, right? And it's, it's also weirdly it's nostalgic. Been so long. Too. It's like I, I was it just really I been. forgot to mention, but I think the first time I the first time I like saw you in the game and stuff was Star's video that you were in. <laughs> you know, the where you just break the game. That it's such oh, a good video. If anyone hasn't seen that video, it's so good. Probably my favorite career memory, that video. Oh, it's so good. Because you know, a large part of what I do, like I'm, I'm a game developer, obviously, but in the industry, mostly w- what I do is I educate yeah, and game developers, and stuff, yeah. I consult, I travel around the world helping developers in places where game development isn't as big. I help them connect to all the resources and all the stuff we have. But a large part of what I believe as an industry we can do better is communicating what game development is. Yeah. And Nuclear Throne did a large part of that with like the live development, but I think... The interplay between me and Star (laughs) that evening, just like coming up with ridiculous ideas and seeing what happens, that's such a big part of game development that we normally don't talk about. Like a lot of people think that when you start on a game, you kind of have like this big idea of what the game is going to be like. I can guarantee you, we had no idea (laughs) uh, about the Frozen City. We had no idea about Little Hunter. We had no idea about the the palace. We had no idea about uh, the crowns. We just made a tiny top-down platformer, <laughs> like a, t- a top-down action shooter, and then eventually went like, "Huh, maybe what? How about a triple bazooka?" Yeah, uh, you know, and you just kind of like wing it, honestly. Like you, you set your outer bounds. You kind of set your parameters. Your, your, your like this is what the game is. This is what the game isn't. But then after that, you just kind of you got to go with what happens, right? Gotta like the play game. With it. <laughs> It's like it's like I always say it's like a plant, right? Like you can you can pick the pot and you can pick where you put it. You can pick the ground and you can put you can pick the seeds that you're going to put in the ground. But when it starts growing, it's going to grow in a direction, a certain shape. And yeah, you can you can steer it, but if you try to steer it too hard, it'll break and die. Right? A game is very much like that. It's like a plant. You you create sort of like the circumstances for the right plant to grow, but then you got to accept that it will part of it will go as you wish and part of it won't. Um, and I actually think that's the most fun part. So that video is just, yeah, I mean, every like laugh in that it, yeah. is just 100% earned by just the preposterousness. <laughs> and it was so good because I obviously had a stream on the delay. So like I already <laughs> knew what he was going to play and then he would yeah. just start laughing and I would just start <laughs> laughing because I could kind of imagine what was going to be. Yeah. It was such a good evening. It, but it, this call was also just really fun for me just because I haven't been Vlambeer for a while. Yeah. Right. And you know, it's it's an identity I've had for like a decade, and giving an interview from sort of like the Vlambeer perspective yeah, from that is perspective. actually actually really fun. So I don't know. This was super fun. Thanks for having me. Vlambeer started when I was twenty. Wow. Right. I'm so, older than that. <laughs> yeah. So it was really one of those things where you're like, a decade of your life. Yeah. Is this thing, and half of that was Nuclear Throne. Yeah, big time. Right. So. Uh, this game will always have a very special place in my heart. And, you know, it's one of those things where you, it's so good to see the mod community still going and the daily community and the, the weekly community and people still talking about the game. And st- people are still referring to the game. Like, you know, if 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 Lambert had if Lambert had been a different studio, a different kind of studio, you could have seen us play with this game a lot more into the future. But I'm really proud of, of where it is now. And it's just really fun to see that that it's still beloved. So yeah, like I said, uh, what, I play it almost every day. It's top five uh, games easily. <laughs> as a creator, what more can you hope for, right? Like yeah. wrapping up on a game, and then five years later, having an interview <laughs> with somebody who plays the game every day. Yeah, you uh, started playing it when they were fourteen. <laughs> right? Like how, how how amazing is that? Like, yeah, this is yeah. this is all you can wish for when you make stuff. Is that it that it matters to people and. I think Nuclear Throne did matter to a lot. It did people. and does. <laughs> yeah, 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 and does. How, yeah, how incredible. 